Welcome to another episode of Open Run. Uh, you know, as usual, we have the player development specialist, Chris Ward. We got the director of Skill Center Elite Basketball, John Arroyo, the four-time state champion, Georgia history. Uh, Andre Lewis will be, out, be with us shortly. And we have a special guest, Mr. James Harper. James Harper was a standout at Fletcher High School, also played college basketball at the University of South Florida. His senior year, he averaged 17 points and nine rebounds. Oh, y'all did some research. Look at that. <laughs> hey, that's what we do around here. <laughs> Hart, did you, were, were you first that's team? What's up. Were you first team all conference USA? Uh, no, I was um, I was second team. Second team all conference USA. Yeah, yeah you got robbed, so, man. It's all good, man. I had fun though, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that's a great. That was a great finish, man. The college career, man. Seventeen and nine, boy. You can't beat that with a bat. Well, you, the crazy part about it is, my favorite year is when I averaged ten and ten, which was my junior year. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I mean, a lot of people look at it like, oh, you scored, you know, you scored seventeen and so on and so forth. But I, I mean, the ten and ten was more fun to me. It really was. Yeah, but I so, remember. I remember your senior year. You really had to. Eat. I, I saw. That's why I saw your game transcend. Transcend, and you were more of a, a leader that year when you yeah. were seventeen. And that's that's what I appreciate yeah. the most. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was it was definitely more uh, mentally tougher to try to try to be that guy. Um, you know, because because sometimes you know some some captains they they don't have to um, be the quote unquote man. They just know how to lead. Right. Uh, but in my case, I had to do a little bit of both. So it was it was tough. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So let's jump right in. So today's topic. So should a coach have basketball playing experience? And if so, at what level? Let's uh, let me, what I, 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 I'll start it off. Right, um, I, I look at it both ways. I mean, I, I truly believe that you have to be part of the game in some form, uh, whether it's coaching or playing. Uh, you have to be around it. Um, but I do consider that um, if you haven't been in a situation, how are you going to tell somebody how to, um, how to act in that situation? For instance, for me, if I'm, you know, I was a little guard. If I got trapped, I had, a, you know, I learned how to get out of it. So how is somebody that wasn't a, a, a point guard or, or played with a point guard that was on that level can tell their guard how to maneuver? Um, I'm not, and then, but then on the flip side, you got some people that can study and, and they're real good with statistics or they're real good with, um, just understanding how a player plays. So I'm, I'm more 70, 30, in my opinion, I think, uh, you, you do have to play, uh, more than you don't. That's my opinion. Right, what about you, Chris? Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of, I don't know, you know, because I'm not going to say a coach has to play, but I think you have more you have more experience, you have more knowledge if you are or understanding if you have played on a high level or you play on a level and you're still a good coach, you know how to transfer some of those skills. Uh, but as far as you have you have those guys that really can understand the game by watching a lot of video, uh, just seeing the change of pace, they're good X and O's. Uh, they understand the strategy, sitting under the bench, paying attention. You know, just say that kid on the high school team that understands tempo, they understand just as much about the game as you do, but they're just not as talented as you are. But their basketball IQ is super high. You know, so you might say, man, in hell, you know, they may be practice, practice players out this world, but they're not going to get in the game just because they don't have the same skill set that you have, but they have a higher understanding of the game. So I think there's some good coaches out there that have never played. They just they're, they're pretty good X and X and O's guys, and they just understand the uh, flow of the game, you know. But I think as far as being able to relate to players, uh, those guys that play are able to relate to play, players better uh, because you you understand what you what they've been through, you understand what they're going through, you understand the movement, you understand the um, strategies, and you understand how to counter things on the floor you know, a little bit better and transfer the skills that you learn. So I think uh, 
guys that have played are a little bit more prepared just because they can relate to the players better. All right, what you think, Hart? Um, I, I agree with all you guys. Um, I say it's probably, um, I say 70, 30, but, but what I like to say is guys that guys or girls that have played, um, at a high level or a higher level than the level that they're coaching. I feel like more often than not, they hit the ground running. Whereas someone without that playing experience, it takes them years to get to that particular point. You know what I'm saying? Um, obviously, we know that you don't have to have player experience to to um, to be a successful head coach. Um, you know, I, I'd say that's two parts because you can you could be a, a great X and O guy, or you don't have to be. But if you if you're smart enough to put smart people around you <clears throat> on your bench, that's going to be effective as well. That's gonna that's gonna help you become a better coach. You know, um, because I I know of some I know of some programs that um, at the high school level where the head coach might have about you know five to ten years of experience, but then again. On his bench, he has about two or three college players or even players that have went overseas and made money playing um, on the bench. And they've pretty much, you know, let him be that guy. But, you know, behind closed doors, let him in on, on a lot of things that he didn't know before, you know. Okay. What do you think, Joe? Um, I mean, I, I think I think it – I think it benefits more if the uh, coach has playing experience. Um, and, you know, when you talk, when you talk about the levels, um, you know, I think that uh, – I think it's only right that a professional coach has professional experience. I mean, I, I think that's how it should be done because, you know, sports is one of the only professions that you can – even like broadcasting and stuff. You can be a professional basketball analyst, but you haven't – you haven't practiced in that field of your profession, which I think that's that's ludicrous. That's crazy to me. Like that's like saying um, me. I'm just going because I read a couple books and I studied on on YouTube and looked up some stuff. Now I'm gonna go be a doctor and perform surgeries and stuff like that. Um, I, I just, I mean, I know it's I know it's two different extremes, but I kind of put it in the same you know type of bucket. I think uh, if you're gonna be a professional basketball analyst on ESPN or something like that, I think you need to have practice in that field now you can be a uh like a marv albert where they just kind of yes and it counts you know type of guy but the <laughs> analytical stuff nah man if you if you haven't practiced on that field you should have done it. so let me ask y'all this what's what's the biggest frustration so let's take it young what's the biggest frustration with middle school basketball that you know i don't have a middle school son but all y'all have middle school Sons, what was the biggest frustration for y'all to see y'all kids playing middle school? Middle school is awful. Wow. <laughs> we we all know that. But <laughs> give, me, give me give me two things why it's so bad. Well, first off, I think that the the, the short five game season, I think that's ridiculous. I think right. I think whatever whatever the local high school that you that those kids are gonna be zoned for, <laughs> I, I feel like they should play a full schedule and they should mirror that schedule that that high school plays and played just about that many games right uh, first and foremost and secondly um they'll just pull a teacher and have them coach i saw one lady coaching um at one of the schools man she didn't say a thing like right. she just stood there the whole i mean didn't say nothing at all right. and and, and it, the team was awful and and i mean people, i don't know if she knew i mean she just stood there and didn't say nothing you know but yeah. and I, I bring i bring that up because you know like like they you they just put a teacher out there, so it's like is it is it the same thing? You know what I'm saying? So it is you can't just put anybody out there. But it, even so, you guys talked about that. You know, I agree with everybody that it's 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 seventy thirty or whatnot. But let's look at you brought up the now the the TV ESPN people. So who do y'all listen to more? Uh, a Stephen A. or a Jalen Rose? A Tim Legler? A Tim Legler? Or uh, 
whatever the what's the white dude name um that be arguing with Stephen A. Skip Skip Bayless. I listen to Legland and Rose. <laughs> uh, so do I. So do I. But it, do y'all it, listen? It's different. It's different when someone uh, such as a Rose or a Legler, they they'll give you their analysis and then they'll give you an experience that they had previously to make right. it make sense. Right, right. Where right. Skip Bayless, like when Jalen got on Skip Bayless years ago talking about he averaged one point, two points on JV. Right. And all this other type of stuff like that. Like, you know, it, it's just Jalen, Jalen can give a perspective, a player's perspective where he's actually felt that feeling before. Right. Right. Whereas a skip or a Stephen A, supposedly he played D3 or whatever, but, you know, he's more so basketball is his thing. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I get it, but I, I'd much rather listen to Jalen or Legler because they played at the highest level and they could use a million and one examples to support their reasoning. Yeah, and not, not only that, but you know, and I, I'm a big advocate for, for those um, – those guys who have never played, uh, especially the ones that just really understand the game. I mean, you got some kids that you know are just going to be uh, basketball geniuses. They're just going to be basketball heads just because they're around the game so much. And, you know, we talk about that for, for uh, with the skill center and those kids that we know that are not going to play college basketball, but they'll have uh, ways they can stay around the game just because they understand the game and love the game so much. So I'm not saying they can't be good coaches. The only thing they're not going to be able to do is they're not going to be able to relate to the uh, the play. They're not going to be able to re- relate to what the players are going through as far as being on the court. Now, the X's and O's, I mean, you, you look at a guy like Lawrence Frank. Lawrence Frank didn't play one bit of uh, basketball. And if you know his story, you know, he was a manager. Uh, he's a pretty good uh coach at the NBA level. Uh, now, when I would love to play for somebody like that, yeah, I would love to play for somebody like that because he busts his ass to get to where he is. Like, he had to fight a lot of battles. Hey, but, Chris, like Harper said, who was his assistant coaches with the Nets? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, Jason Kidd. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, of course, you're going to have people around you. Uh, but I'm just saying as far as he got there because of his, his knowledge of the game and his understanding of the game. Now, uh, who would I like to play for? I would like to play for somebody that has played. Doc who Rivers. Would I like, to tra- like Who would I like to train with? Well, I would like to train with somebody that, that understands what I'm going to go through in situations. I mean, I would just love that. You know, so you're talking about coaches that go for trainers as well or skill development people. You know, uh, Tyson's going to go out and train with Joe Abunasar. Joe hasn't played – basketball but from a Joe attacks it from a a science you know an exercise science piece as far as understanding the movement uh studying film uh and watching film and just being around it so long to where he's taking it from the weight room and movement and to transferring it to the coat court and doing the same thing and just watching games and studying film he was a manager as well uh, so he's probably one of the best uh, skill development uh, people in the country, if not but, the world. But he studied this for so many years. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like this was his life. This was his job. He, this was his career. He knew that's what he wanted to do because, for instance, if, um, if, if, if Lawrence Frank 15 years ago or whatnot walked into the gym and Doc Rivers walked into the gym and said, yo, I'm starting an AAU team, who would your kids have played for? And he, they weren't, they, you know, not take away the names, but just, you know, just. So, to, so the reason why, the reason why I use both of them is because they were, uh, they, they're really good friends. And they told me a story about them being a five star. And when they were, you, y'all remember five star, five star was a big thing. It was like, mm-hmm. and so they would never let them coach at five star. They would make them work the canteen. So they had to work like the candy shack and things like that. And, you know, here it is. You know, 15, 20 years later, you got Joe Bunasar, one of the top trainers in the world, and Lawrence Frank, an NBA guy, an NBA coach, head coach. But they had to work the canteen. They wouldn't let him coach at five-star. 
you know, so, but those are the guys that, you know, you have guys like that. You have stories like that. So who, who would I like to play for? Well, at least you're going to have somebody on your coaching staff that has done it, you know. So it's always, but you got those guys that are exes and those guys that, you know, you just, everybody can't think like that. Yeah, Eric Spost is another name that comes to mind. Um, but, you know, you always hear the thing about what people always say, uh, well, great players don't always make great coaches and things like that. I think, I think the issue with that is um, the great players, their relatable experience is much different than the vast majority of the players that they're actually coaching. Because, uh, okay, so let's say uh, Magic Johnson, that little stint he had when he was coaching the Lakers. Magic's work ethic and what he had to go through was completely different than 95% of all, you know, the guys that he's coaching. He might have had one or two guys that was on his level that the relatable experience is there. I think the coaches that were like role players, like a Steve Kerr, uh, some of those guys make better coaches is because their relatable experience. It, it, Popovich. It hits Popovich is another one. Phil Jackson. It hits. It hits yeah. more. It hits more of the uh, the, the masses of the uh, players that they're coaching. I think that's why you see uh, great players kind of struggle as when it when it comes to coaching because I guess the expectations might be different than what they have for themselves that they try to put on everybody. Or, or what, but it's, it's, you know, I, I'd like to say with Magic, Magic situation was to me it was totally different because I do feel like you should at least sit on someone's bench for a year before, right. before you coach, regardless whether you have playing experience or not. Because you know, long time ago, but you know, we we we're sitting there watching Magic, and it's like. You know, I mean, how many, how many, how seasoned is he is drawing up plays or, I mean, yes, he can, he has a feel for the game and he could feel what, you know, uh, he could feel what's going on, but the X and O's and the strategizing for the team, not just himself, but, you know, it's totally different, you know, it's different. It's different in a way that. I feel like he also has to see it from a perspective of sitting, watching, having to help put stuff together with another coach during a game so he could then translate it in to, to, to a regular scenario. You know and what I, I mean? Remember Jason Kidd got that head coach job and the season wasn't even over yet as a player for him. He jumped right yeah. in. But, but he did put some guys around him. Absolutely. At, you know what I'm saying? The guys I mean, some, some guys are different, but you also know Magic wasn't the greatest communicator neither when he first retired. That's true. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, he's he's developed not only to be a great communicator, but developed to be a great businessman. Like, Magic was, in my estimation, he he's my favorite, by the way, so I'm not knocking him. Mine too. But I, I, I feel like he was he was just a basketball player at that point in time in his life. And then he turns around, it's like, okay, Magic, we want you to coach this team. You know, whereas Jason Kidd, Kidd was a was a was a was a real communicator. And yeah. I mean it just But but you you're looking at Larry Bird was the same thing. He had the same issues. Yeah. Um uh, yeah. Isaiah Thomas had the same issues. Yeah. They did well. You know? As yeah, an example. They did yeah, well, but 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 Bird 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 won some games in Indiana, and then when uh when Isaiah well Isaiah was just he was just on this different he got to switch over some different shit. And that's another topic. But let me let me go back to to coaching as a player. So as a player, I can understand what Harper's saying because I'm not an X and O type of guy. My yeah. assistant coach right now is Josh Perry. So if it's a timeout, Perry come on. I say yo, drop something. I'm the motivator. I, you know, so when I coached, so Magic was probably, he know what to do in every situation. But he didn't know how to teach it. Right. So that's the, that's the biggest difference. But then if there's a guy that, that's never played, can he truly motivate? So he might drop the X and O's or whatever, but the motivation part may be missing because he may not know how to motivate certain people. Well, well, you know, here, here's the thing, and I think I think it's different. I think they can, uh, because they're gonna just say those managers. You know, um, you guys had managers on your team who were just good 
just they were like your teammate. They're just good team dudes. Always got the right thing to say. Sometimes too much to say, uh, but they always knew what to say, when to say it. Uh, and they always knew when to step back and, and play their role as a manager as well. So if you ever watch some of those managers that are really good, they 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 understand the game. Yeah. Uh, they they don't they don't play it, but they understand the game. And, and they're going to be those are the ones that are going to be they're going to be in the gym with you at one o'clock in the morning when you want to put up shots. That's right. Uh, right. So they they really love to, it. Yeah. So they're the ones that are going to become coaches. Like they can't play. But they see, okay, this is where I can stay around the game. And they're going to become really, really – they're going to soak it up because they're going to hang out with you and they're going to understand you off the court. And they're going to listen to the coaches there and they're going to hang out with them and they're going to hear everything and they're going to soak up everything. So when it's time to coach and manage a team, they'll be able to do that. But as far as the on-the-court experience, they'll never have that. In so a way, they're I can... not going to – Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. In a way, I guess their role is kind of like a walk-on player. They, their, their role to becoming that coach is a lot harder. They got to really pay their dues to get there as opposed to the players. They can jump right into an assistant or a work-study type of program um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and coach like that. But, uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I definitely see your point. So let's well, let, me, let, me, let me say this. As a former walk-on, I, I agree with you 100% because every day was, a, was an interview. Right. Every day was an interview. You had to prove to your players, to your coaches, to everybody. First in every sprint. Man, what? what? In the weight room. Oh, oh, that hey. that warm-up line, ben I took was sweating, boy. Charges. Yeah, <laughs> hey, yes, sir. And they used to be like, why don't you play like Johnny? And they'd be like, well, why don't you play him more then? You just keep loving this dude. <laughs> but so I agree with you on that part. Uh, but let, let's – do you think that uh, – so we're talking about coaching. I, I'm big on – if I'm coaching – I got to be able to demonstrate what I'm telling these kids. I think that's huge as a coach. Like, if you tell them, yo, you got a, you know, I don't know, two dribble crossover, come off the pick, you know, drag dribble a little bit, drop a pass if it's open. If not, you take the shot type of thing. Um, is that important for you guys as a coach that you got to be able to demonstrate stuff? Well, that's more we'll skill. No. That's kind of like more skill development, I think. Yeah. I would say I would say no to that, because I I mean I I know of of um, many older coaches that and had hip surgery or gotcha. knee yeah. surgery or whatever, and they have kids that you know um it, it, and and it, and it also comes with just experience. You know what I'm saying? Being able to break down like for for me, I'm a big film guy. You know, is 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 trying to help coach. I'm a big film guy. I'm I, I like to bring a kid in, and even if it's recording part of a practice, and say, "Hey, you see how you came off that screen? You need to hesitate a little bit, and and if the big comes up, then you attack the leg. If he sits back, then you pop the shot. I mean, you know, but they have to be able to see that as well. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. You could even, I mean, you could even show them in practice. But I think it's a little different if they see it. You know what I'm saying? If they're able to see their mistake, right? Then, then it, then it turns out, and it ends up turning out better. I, mean, I don't know. And, and I use, I use, uh, I use a lot of film, but I use it for them to uh, go pay attention to other players. Like if I wanted to teach a kid how to drag off a screen, I would tell them to go YouTube um, Steve Nash and uh, Amari Stoudemire. Watch out, watch out, um, Amari Stoudemire, Santia, I used to use it a lot with Santia. Watch how he runs down the middle of the floor. And then I tell Jalen, watch how Steve Nash just drags off his, like Amari Stoudemire don't even know it's coming. And right. he's dragging off his, you know, so I, I would give them examples of people who to go watch, you know, as far as if I'm trying to get my point across. Even though I can show them, some kids are visuals. They, they need, they need, we can talk it all the way out but they need to see somebody else doing it before they can do it. So some of those coaches are really, like James said, they break down a film, man, and they have, they'll have pieces for you. You know, you get a good and, – and usually your, your video guys were, were managers. Right. And they're going to – they'll get they'll send you 100 clips of things that you can do and you can do better. They can send you your positives and your negatives. And you're like, damn, where y'all get this from? And show you exactly where where you need to do it and how how it needs to be done. So 
I learned more from watching film than anything else. I, you know, I would uh, things that I would be more conscious of, like getting beat on a straight flash. Like if I'm if I'm we're in the zone and I'm playing the middle, and I let the guy flash in front of me, and then I follow him. Uh. As opposed to stepping in front, you know what I'm saying? Just showing me, look, Joe, you got beat on the street. And sometimes film can be embarrassing if it's your day. You right. Know what I'm it can be it can be tough to watch film. And you know, sometimes it can be great. Other things I learned from film too is thinking I was playing hard and looking at myself on film was like, damn, man, I'm lazy as hell. You know what I'm saying? Hey, it was what's crazy. I was watching with Tyson uh, a couple weeks ago, and he was like, Man, I should have run I should run the floor more. I say yeah. Then he then he made the excuse of well I know I ain't gonna get the ball. Hey, the hell with that. Right. Just like you sitting here, I'm watching it. You watching? You said, man, I should run. Just think of a scout is watching you. What they're gonna think? Man, I wish you run the floor. Let 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 them make that decision. Then why won't they get in the ball? Run the floor and then let somebody else make that critique. Of but look, at, at what age? You know, you guys all have older kids. Me and Joe is the closest to the, you know, I got elementary. But at what age do you really think film is beneficial? It might be all the time, but dealing with young kids, are they really going to soak that in? Me and JoJo looked at been looking at clips in second grade. Um, and he, he learns. that. That's why, like, JoJo, he's defensively, he's always in the right spot. He's always in the right place. And, and that's what I was that's what I was explaining to Tasha. I'm like, look, he's like if somebody if his teammate gets beat, JoJo's always there with his hands up. And I'm like, and they would still score sometimes, but I'm like, now think about it. If he's six nine, six ten, and he beat, gets to that spot of his hands up, now that's a big deal. You know what I'm right. saying? Like right, right. And, yeah. but that's because I show him stuff on film all the time and he knows how to play the middle of the zone better than anybody. And you know what I'm saying? Just and this all comes from us watching film and he's always been like that. But we've always used film and talk about that. What about what about uh training? Do you think that <laughs> as a trainer, you've had to play the game on on whatever level? We'll let y'all go on that one. <laughs> I would say I would say the same the same way that that you need to be a player to be a coach. You need to be you you need to be uh, the same as a trainer. And I'll say this because I've experienced watching some trainers that, you know, they teach all the fancy stuff. Right. I mean, for me, the game is played in the paint. So why aren't you teaching this kid one move, don't play with him, get to the paint? Yep. Bam, bam, get to the paint. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Get to whatever it is, get to the paint. Unless you just shooting a rock on a on a wide open shot you get into the paint and all this fancy stuff that they teach in these kids sometimes it's like that doesn't even make sense why why would this this why are you teaching a player to do all this dancing instead of getting to the bucket right. you shouldn't be having to take four or five dribbles just to get to the bucket right but so, it'll make it'll make your film look a whole lot better that's what in my oh, opinion that's why they doing it yeah i guess hey, but, and, yeah. and the thing about I mean, it, it'll win games Right. Yeah, but the, but the thing about that is, Sue, you know, you're teaching that. That comes from basketball. That should come from basketball IQ. Right. So that's what we call your counter moves. So we teach you how to get to the basket. We teach you how to beat your defender. Now, what you do with that second defender, that's called basketball IQ. That's called change of speed. That's just called a court awareness. Like, you should know this. This should be a natural – that should be a natural piece that comes to you just – naturally just based on you know somebody's going to come there so you know to pull up or you need to cross over and use your left or however you, your counter you add your counter move to it so i i do and i don't agree because i've seen some pretty good guys out there that have done it on that level uh and doing it on a pro level that have never played uh but they understand it from a scientific piece. Like, wait hold on hold on when you say never played like, like never played like, like never played, like didn't play high school. I mean, they just, they were around it. Um, they were around basketball. You know, you have some guys that uh, they can take exercise science and move it to the court. Right. And because that's all that basketball is about. Change of speed, change of direction, learning how to explode, explode out, sitting down nice and low, uh, getting from point A to point B in a certain time with, like James said, limited movement. 
you know, that's get to the get to, anybody can teach a jab crossover step. And let me so ask any, you this, Chris, like how how much experience did those particular trainers have that did oh, not have playing it. experience? Years. Years. You know, like years of it. Like you know, I'm not you know, I'm not saying it from a these guys are older guys now. They've been doing it for a while. Uh, and they've been doing it on a pro side for a while. The thing that bothers me is every you know, like I try to say it for myself. I try to separate myself from everyone. Not saying I'm the best, but I have about 20 years doing this. Uh, and I've done it on every single level that you can think of, even for playing wise. You know, high school, college, pro, division one, division two, JUCO. <laughs> like, you know, and I coached on that level and also trained guys on that level. And I learned I learned a lot of stuff from guys as I went on, but these were guys that were already doing it. I didn't learn from a younger guy, I learned from a lot of older guys that were already doing it. And I put my own little sauce on it. But you that's know, what I'm saying I, though. They they've had years of of uh studying, years of learning. And I think those guys that you're talking about, like most of our kids around the area aren't going to be able to walk, train with those guys because they've studied for so long, they're on a different level. So they're on a whole other level. Right. So I'm talking about just, just you know, with, with uh, a lot of our the kids. Grassroots. Yeah, grassroots. Like anybody and everybody. Y'all know I'll see things on Instagram talking about AKA trainer, AKA coach. And I'm like, damn, who the hell is this dude? And, and yeah, you know, we doing this, we doing that. And I'm like, I, for me, even as a fourth grader, Junior and Jaden, I don't work on no three-point shot. I don't really work on, like, going all the way to the layup. Man, my whole thing is 15-footers. Be good at the 15-footers. One dribble well, pull-up, two dribble pull-up. Well, the thing pull about it is you, you got to be able to teach kids how to finish, too. And you got to teach them different ways to finish, finish strong. Uh, the level they're playing at. Uh, majority of the game, actually, eighty percent of the game is going to be layups. It's pressing uh, the layups. Yeah, yeah but so. I don't give a but see, I don't give a damn about how the, the, they play AAU yeah. because but, I'm no, I'm using all this to get him ready for later. Because if he well, if he can understand the game now at the fourth grade level, like I don't get happy for you pressing and laying up, pressing and yeah, I'm cool with the winning, but I want you to really understand the game. Yeah, and that's that. That goes, and you talk about the trainers, or, and I try to, like I said, I try to separate myself by saying I'm a developmental specialist uh, because I go based off experience, exposure, and education, uh, and I try to use that, and I put a lot of time into it, and I watch a lot of different things. Like I go watch the games when I watch my kids play, not to see the game and enjoy the game, to see what we need to work on based on their movement in the game, based on the things they're doing in the game. Uh, so that's how I try to watch games. You know, when you start using all these different props and these different things, I mean, like, you don't ain't no props on the floor. Like, you, you just teach kids the fundamentals and basic, give them a strong foundation. And all these guys that want to do this training, they, they think it's some new type of science to it, and it's really not. There, There's no science to basketball other than pass, shoot, uh, defense, you know, catch. I mean... There's, there's no science to it. Well, let, let, me, ask, let me ask all of you, though, man. When you're looking for a coach for your child or a trainer for your child, what, are the, what is the number one thing you look for? Passion and purpose. Yeah, I agree with that. Passion and purpose. Now, to, like for, for me, as far as a, a, a training having playing, a, a, a trainer having player, playing experience, I think it also gives you an advantage. Cause I think about myself, like I stayed home and didn't go play professionally, but, and I used to play in the little local leagues around here. But when, when, when Chris Hart, uh, Fred, even Ron Hill, Shay, Carl Thomas, when them guys came home, the dirty, what I used to consider dirty tricks because nobody <laughs> was doing it around here that they were doing was, you know what I'm saying? It was stuff that they learned from playing. And so they would come and do it to me and I would steal it from them, and I would do it to these guys in the league, and they used to work. Like Fred Lewis would hold your wrist on the post. All the time. <laughs> he said all the time. Oh, and he, my and goodness. he was so strong, you're trying to get your hand out, and he by the time you get your hand out, he got the ball. So you couldn't deny him on the post, and once he caught it, he was going to crab you, crab you, crab you, right hand hook. 
grabbed it, grabbed it, grabbed the left hand hook. And there was nothing you could do but those tricks that he picked up. From, and then even CT, he would catch the ball on the wing. If you were in the defensive stance and you had that leg up, he going to grab your ankle and go around you and you can't step back and move and he get a stop on you. Like, he learned that from playing because he didn't get that from Tampa. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but then those guys can transfer those skills to the kids that they're coaching or they're training. And I think that that's the advantage that they have from playing the game. You know, and that's the sad piece. Kids don't want that anymore. They want to go with the, uh, you know, y'all tell me all the time, Chris, you need to do this on film. You need to put this on film. And I'm just a simple dude, man. And and the kids, they go with what they see on film. They don't, they don't, they don't go with what works. I mean, because if I rattle off how many guys came out of a gym that I've trained and worked with that play pro ball, uh, that play college basketball, I mean, the numbers would be, it would be nice. I mean, if I rattled it off, so I don't promote like that. I promote fundamentals, basic, strong foundation, passion and purpose. I mean, that's that's it. And kids don't want that. Kids want flash. They want right now. They want showmanship. They want videos in there. They want somebody in the, in the face with the camera, you know, and the oohs and ahs and the music behind it. And I don't have all that, that with me. And so for me, I'm not for everybody. You know, I'm not at all. But I know I got some products out there, and we're about to see one pretty soon come in June uh, that that will show everybody what what it's about and why why we do what we do, and it's just basics and fundamentals. Well, no, I think you said it right, Chris. I think you know you you can't fault anybody for uh, no. choosing a coach or choosing a trainer or whatnot. But the proof is in the pudding, in my opinion. Um, I do I do notice that um, what Joe just said. I think the the playing experience may be more valuable as a trainer than it is as a coach in the long run, uh, because you you can you can study the game and and be successful in that, um, as well as put people around you. But then when you're teaching the game, the, the development of the game, because a lot of parents get you know they might leave a team because oh you're not developing my child. It's kind of hard to develop your child when you're get to gym maybe twice a week or you don't do an individual type of thing. So I think you guys are right about the training aspect of it. And um, I think that's, that's the key. Um, but it does look, I never considered myself no trainer. Yeah. I play basketball, I consider myself a basketball player, but a lot of people like what I do or what they see when I do with the little guys and whatnot. Um, but at the same time, I think that uh, you can take bits and pieces from, from everything. But I think it's it's up to you as a parent. You got to put them in a, in the right situation. It just aggravated me when everybody proclaimed itself as a as a trainer. That yeah, that's the but, thing that that kills me. Yeah, but there's a difference too. Like like I just tell people, I don't want to be called a coach. You know, because you can call somebody at the boys and girls club who make eight dollars an hour a coach. I when mean, you go to PE, difference. you see your coach. Yeah, like right. you know, it's a it's it's a it's a big difference. You know, and I. I say this, when you consider yourself a developmental specialist, that means you're developing that kid from a holistic approach. Like it's not just about the basketball, it's about transferring those skills off the court as well. You know, teaching those habits off the court as well. Teaching them kids how to, how to define their own greatness by making people better. That's how you define yourself as far as a developmental specialist. That's what separates yourself. How are your kids, how are they going to be prepared, not just on the court, how are they going to prepare off the court? Are they going to come and every single day, are they going to want to give you everything they got? You know, are they going to be able to listen? Some guys just go there for, like I said, some kids should go to the gym because the camera in the gym. Just telling you, they go to, they, they go to get a mixtape or to be on somebody's mixtape. You know, and then you, like I said, I'm not for everybody. You know, and that's why, you know, I have certain kids that come to me. I have certain kids that don't. I'm for those kids that want to get better, but just want a strong foundation with transferable skills. So that means they're going to be prepared to play for anybody. They're going to be able to learn from anybody just because they have a strong foundation. They have the basics and fundamentals already. They already possess it. You know, so if you look at my teams at Hillsborough, people will say, well, you know, how do y'all stay in the games? My kids are fundamentally sound. We're not the best team. And granted, basketball ain't the toughest. But there's some games and some teams that should have beat the hell out of us. But because kids are fundamentally sound and they're prepared, they're ready to go and they can play with anybody. 
All right, Harp, you got any final thoughts for us before we wrap up? Oh, uh, no, not really, man. I, I just, well, I guess I do. Um, I just feel like the game, I mean, it experiences everything. You know, uh, even in the classroom, I want to say, what is it? When they look at hands-on learners, kinesthetic learners, but 70% of people are hands-on learners. You know, and it, it goes with the game of basketball or pretty much any sport as well. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot tougher and it's a bigger learning curve when you don't have that end game. I've been there before. I've seen it, done it, smelt it. You know, it, it, it's different. It's, it, it is a longer learning curve, in my opinion. Yeah, but Harv, you got, you got a son over there right now. Uh, who had a pretty good, pretty good uh, high school career? How hard is it for me? And he's a fundamentally sound kid. He doesn't do anything flashy. He just gets it done. And it's crazy that nobody's recruiting him. You know, well, or he's not getting the love he, that he, he should. Yeah, it, it's funny. Um, at, at this at this stage, at right now, he's what they call a tweener, um, where um, he's a low D one prospect and a high D2 prospect. And so um, right now, as far as what's going on with him, he has a lot of, of D2s in uh, NAIA schools, you know, shooting a shot, you know. Um, but this is a perfect time for them to shoot their shot because a lot of players, a lot of kids that are in his situation are or are taking those opportunities, which isn't which isn't a bad thing. But what I feel is they're taking them more so out of 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 nervousness and anxiousness, like nothing else is coming down the pipeline. And yeah. it's D two and NAI's job at this point to get as many tweeners as they can and bring them on in bring them on into the fold because what's happening is you and I both know I'd say maybe 30% of kids sign in the month of June or July, you know, no. um, because what's, what's going on is the D ones are waiting on the, the, the three, the four, board. five star Thanks. athletes to, to and sign and waiting on those dominoes to fall. And, and, the portal. and yeah. And, and, and you got the, the, the portal, so they're waiting on all those chips to fall, and then that's why in June and July is when, you know, they come back, oh, well, we lost this guy, this guy, this guy. Oh, okay, well, let's give give this kid a call. Because at, at this stage, he's, you know, it's funny, he's getting these offers, these Z2 offers, but he's also getting calls and texts daily from, from different schools um, that are D1. So... You know, I'm I'm just telling him worst case scenario, just because at this stage, it seems like most colleges they want the older kid, yeah. but but most most NBA scouts they want the younger kid. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's a it's a catch twenty two. So yeah. I'm telling him, well, if you go to prep, I mean, you're still coming out at eighteen after a year of prep. What about Big a year deal. JUCO? You know. Either or, you know what I'm saying? So we'll see, man. But he he's gonna be okay. I I I know he'll be okay. Um uh, it's all it takes is one, you know. You as you know, it, it just takes one. Once he gets the one, then it's what it is. If he doesn't, then you know, go prep a JUCO, live to fight another day, and you know, once he gets a chance, he'll do what he gotta do. Well, sir. Yep. All right, fellas. Well, that's our time, Hart. Man, appreciate you coming on, man. We got to do it again. Appreciate you, Hart. Yeah, man. I got I got to come that way soon, though. I got to come that way soon. For sure. We're gonna get together, man. When this when this mess over, we're gonna get together. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. All right, right, fellas. All right. right, Peace. Yo, pump it up.